Hi, welcome to Tab's Two Cents, the show where we talk about finance, business, and achieving success. Today on the show, we have the host of Carbonomics. We talk everything carbon credits, ESG, macro energy, and even go through a couple of individual names like Star Royalties and Carbon Streamer. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Tab's Two Cents, the show where we discuss multiple income streams and macro factors affecting the world today. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. I really wanted to get you on because I've been following your Twitter feed. It's at Carbonomics. And it seems like you and I have a lot of similar interests in the fields of carbon, energy, you know, ESG. So I thought we could just sort of start with what's your perspective on the landscape for carbon and ESG currently? Currently, it's not particularly looking good. You know, just generally speaking for the stocks themselves, yeah, as we know, this the stock market's really a function of liquidity, right? So, yeah, you know, when we're having a recession, especially you know surrounding an energy crisis, that particularly puts a, a target on ESG's back. But um, amazingly, at the same time, you know, it's been pretty interesting that we've been seeing a, a lot of deals happening in the carbon space. Actually, like we just had BMO, you know, the Bank of Montreal was buying Radical Group, which does you know carbon advising and offset project development, and then Blackstone just invested a four hundred million in Expansive, which you know is kind of a marketplace that trades you know futures and other products for ESG commodities. So we've actually been seeing a surprising amount of deals in the space, and also it seems like the government. Governments in Europe and some of the first world nations actually haven't been backing off of ESG very much, which has been quite surprising to me, especially when there's definitely been a lot of pain already. We could definitely see a lot more in the general markets and with the consumer. So yeah, we'll kind of just have to see how it goes from here, honestly. Yeah, I find that interesting as well to see that governments are kind of holding a hard line on what they believe to be their climate initiatives. And one thing that I've sort of heard on radio and otherwise is when you talk about ESG in a bear market, they're really starting to get scrutinized. So some of these, say, solar companies, for example, which fall under the E, environmental some of their practices in which they get materials from other countries and those mining operations perhaps couldn't be quite in line with the social requirements of certain ESG funds. And it seems like in these bear markets, they're really starting to get some attention as far as what's actually ESG and what isn't. What do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. And when I typically focus on ESG, it, it's typically just on the environmental aspect is kind of what I'm thinking about when it comes to investing. Yeah, it doesn't particularly fuse me to focus on companies solely based off of, you know, if they're just trying to hire more women or some of these different quotas. You know, that's not particularly what I'm focused on. It's more of that environmental aspect is where you know, a lot of the money is going to be made here because we've seen some very large institutional funds, you know, setting up ESG specific mandates and different things like that, like BlackRock trying to have their entire portfolio go net zero. I forget what specific year it is, but probably, you know, 2040, 2050, something like that. So we've definitely seen that in the space for sure, but not necessarily focused on that social or governance aspect. It's mainly focused on the E environmental. Yeah. And I think the issue with the one operation I was discussing was that on the social side, they were using Uyghurs to mine the rare earth metals in China. So, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> the, social, the social can go all over the place, you know, from diversity to unethical practices that way. And it is interesting to think how wide of a scope ESG can be. So I, I'm like you, I kind of tend to focus on the environmental aspect. And I think it's because, as you say, we could see a lot of funds flowing into these areas. When you think about the E, where are you looking? Are you looking specifically energy or are you thinking more, you know, I've seen a couple news articles where they suggest that plastic offsets could be another big thing kind of in line with carbon offsets. Yeah, particularly what I'm focused on is the carbon markets more broadly. I do tend to focus on the energy markets, especially with the compliance markets, you know, which we'll get more into that later, I'm sure. Those tend to directly correlate or at least somewhat correlate with what's going on in energy markets. So you kind of have to focus on these things in tandem. And I also used to be a large investor in the mining space as well. And that was one of the big focuses I had previously. So it's kind of something I've I've always followed. But it's specifically what I'm focusing on is mostly carbon credits and kind of how that those markets operate, but also, you know, other opportunities as well. Yeah, another decently large YouTuber, you know, in the value space is Mariu Skoryeshny. I might have butchered that a little bit, but he's just been posting about a plastic recycler recently. 
So those are some definitely interesting companies that I like to look at as well. But yeah, it's kind of all over the place, general ESG concepts. Yeah. And from an energy standpoint, it's interesting to have someone like you on because you kind of look in the same areas as I do. And I may have an outlier opinion to some that oil and gas, I believe, may be one of the strongest industries moving forward when it comes to carbon offsets and carbon credit creation. And the reason I say that is because, especially on a scope three level, they have so many tons of carbon that they can offset from their operations. And, you know, from a greater macro perspective, I don't see oil going anywhere. So they'll have the funds to do it as well. And also they're probably going to be taxed a lot moving forward. So they're kind of going to have to. And I think what could happen is oil and gas will get really good at offsetting carbon. What do you think about that? A lot of the companies that are mentioned, you know, people covering the space are the large oil and gas players because, you know, there's so many different uses for oil and gas that we don't even think of, you know, in plastics and so many different industrial applications. I'm not going to say it's impossible for us to get rid of oil, but it's a lot more complicated than people are led to believe. You know, and that really brings on the bigger picture that, you know, oil and gas, these companies are going to be some of the largest buyers of offsets and credits because, I mean, there's no other way they're going to reach net zero. You know, a lot of these companies are trying to reach net zero by 2050. You know, a lot of people in this space cover that Shell was mandated by the Dutch government to offset their emissions and try to reduce it by 45% by 2030, I believe. So they're being mandated by the government to do that. And there's no way that they're going to be able to do that without offsets and credits. So, I mean, they're large players in the space. Yeah. And I think where it could lead to eventually is they would just buy offset projects as opposed to the offsets themselves, because then they can reap the benefits of those projects year after year. I know there was a big news article and everybody was up in arms because some of the major ESG funds were starting to buy into large oil and gas companies. And of course, you know, those things together, they don't necessarily sound right when you say ESG, oil and gas, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. But once you start doing some digging and understand what these companies are actually doing and the direction that they're headed, it totally makes sense. They actually are making some of the best progress on the carbon capture. And yeah, I made a video about this. I've talked about this a bit on Twitter as well. I mean, they actually knew about this problem you know, as early as like the 1950s. I mean, they started studying this stuff. So they knew about their impacts on the environment for decades on decades. Yeah. You know, and they've been investing very heavily in carbon capture projects, a lot of the large oil and gas players, because I mean, they can see that ESG is not going away. It's very clear from the governmental level, like so many different players have decided that they're not backing down from their targets. So it, it definitely seems like it's here to stay as far as I can tell. What kind of an impact do you think on carbon markets? And maybe we should just narrow it down to compliance markets in Europe. And basically, you know, just for anybody who's listening, that's a, basically a cap and trade system where everybody's allotted a certain amount of carbon. And if they go over their cap, they pay heavy taxes. And if they stay under, they can sell credits into the market to other mandatory members. What are your thoughts on, let's say, the EU ETS and what's going to happen there just based on the factors resulting? of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, because as you and I both know, coal plants are being fired up all over the place because natural gas is limited and they're experiencing a heat wave and they need more energy. So I'm not sure what your take on that will be. Do you think that they'll maybe give them a little leeway in their requirements? Or do you think that they'll just say, too bad, you got to pay up? This is something that they've been debating for a while. And they were just recently debating about selling 20 billion in allowances. They somehow said that they were, quote unquote, not going to disrupt the market with that. I mean, this is a market that's only worth a couple hundred billion. So, you know, the idea that you're not going to disrupt the market with that is pretty insane to say the least, but the Europeans have been pretty insane in general recently. Do I think that they're going to give any leeway? I mean, so far they've been signaling no, but you know, my inclination is that they're probably going to give some sort of leeway at some point. I, I don't necessarily know what form that's going to take, but I'd be surprised because I mean, if you're going to choose between the survival of many of your industries or your economy in general, General and just giving up on this dream for a little while, they're going to give up on it. I mean, I don't see how that's not going to happen. But you know, so far, they've been signaling that they're not going to do that. So we kind of just have to wait and see what happens, honestly. They are in a hard place, though, because it's almost like when the Fed decides to print money and then the dollar struggles as a result, because with carbon, as soon as people lose belief in that system, then they're going to struggle to keep those prices up. So from my perspective, I'm not sure that they will give because they may 
may just need to find another way, I guess. Maybe they can, you know, supplement some income on the taxes side, but keep the EU ETS intact. What do you think about that? This is somewhat of a reason why I focus on energy markets so much. And it doesn't get a lot of interaction, really. I've noticed as far as when I post on Twitter, you know, a lot of these things involving oil and gas don't get a lot of interaction, but you know, these markets are definitely intertwined and it's going to make a big impact, especially on the compliance markets, what happens here, especially with the EU ETS, obviously, because the EU has been struggling the most with oil and gas. At some point, you know, more supply is going to come online, but there's so many different problems that were caused by, you know, different factors. Uh, YouTube doesn't like you mentioning them, but we kind of know what they are according to supply chains and different actions the government was taking. So yeah, eventually more supply is going to come online for oil and gas, and that's definitely going to help the markets out. It's going to help our market in general. As far as, you know, prices for EUAs, which are the European Union allowances are concerned, they've been holding up pretty well, all things considered. Considered. But I'd imagine at least some of that has to do with Germany and other countries bringing on more coal power plants. So yeah, I mean, there's going to be more emissions in the short term. I think, yeah, emissions had actually risen over the last year or two years. I think I was reading an article about that. So we've been going backwards a little bit here, but there's going to be reprieve at some point. But yeah, it could take longer than people expect. That's kind of why you know governments almost need to back down from these mandates a little bit. And I mean, it's almost necessary. They give some leeway, I mean, to the different industries here, or they're going to have major economic problems. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. I go back to the Fed comparison, you know, everybody said they can't print $2 trillion, but there they were printing away. And it it is what it is. You kind of have to do it at some point. And it's interesting you say that they're going to release $20 billion into a $100 billion market and expect a small amount of impact. And I think that if that was possible, it just shows how over emitting they are. I'm not sure that's the correct term, but how much trouble they're in from an emission standpoint. So they could be, you know, 20% over and they've got to dump these credits in just so everybody can get under their cap. Maybe that's something that they were looking at when they thought about the market impact. What do you think about Uh, that? Yeah, well, I I think they generally, they had been making very good progress. I mean, they had emissions rising recently, but, you know, kind of the transition to natural gas and away from coal had naturally been reducing emissions in, you know, large portions of the first world nations. I mean, France is already dominated by nuclear power, but, you know, you can see a lot of these countries countries don't have very high levels of emissions and they can rely on renewables or different sources of power that are more clean. So they were naturally already moving towards a less emitting environment, but especially Germany. Germany's in the news all the time, but they've been trying to shut down their nuclear and they've been relying on coal instead. And that's just totally backwards, but it's where they've been pushed because of the war. So Yeah, it's interesting. Germany, I guess, has a long standing history of anti-nuclear politics, and it just doesn't seem to make sense from an energy standpoint standpoint, in my opinion. I'm really not sure how, especially in a country as developed as theirs, how they got so far from nuclear. It it almost makes me wonder if it had something to do with World War II, but I I don't know. Honestly, I I haven't looked into specifically what the arguments are Mm -hmm. from Germany, but I'm sure it's some warped political views that are coming into the country and kind of stopping nuclear from uh, expanding there, even taking down a lot of these power plants. Yeah. And so one reason that I think you and I are aligned on this is that in my opinion, especially the way governments have been acting in, as we say, times of war, certainly appears that this is the direction that they're headed and this is a determined path. And what that means is that regardless of anybody's view on climate change and what's happening, there will be money flowing into the space. And from an investment standpoint, that means opportunity for DIY investors and hedge funds alike. One theory that I have on where I'm looking, this is obviously a very broad picture and not a recommendation, but when I look at energy and I see different areas, something I notice that I think is kind of interesting, and there could be somebody out there who knows more than I do. But when you look at hydrogen, it's color coded. So you have green hydrogen, which everybody loves, and it, it's green because it uses low carbon energy to create the hydrogen. And what I notice is that there's no color coding for oil, which I think is kind of interesting. And I feel like I wouldn't be surprised to see some kind of carbon peg added to barrels of oil in the future. And I think as a result of that, you could see North American oil and higher regulated areas do better on a global scale, because if you're using the Paris Agreement and nations need to stay under their mandate, they can buy lower carbon oil from Canada, for example. 
So that's where I'm looking, oil and gas, as well as carbon offset creation due to their daily operations and carbon sequestration and those different technologies. Where are you looking in the carbon space, ESG space? And what do you think about that as a theory? Yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. That's that's actually something that, well, how I originally got interested in ESG in the first place was looking into ABEX technologies. And now it's kind of something that Robert Freeland had been discussing, who's an investor in the companies, one of the largest you know mining investors, pretty well known. He was talking about how there's going to be different labels you know, for all sorts of different materials and where they were sourced from and kind of relating back to NFTs in a way and how you know that kind of makes a unique signature that can be verified. And you can see where all these different commodities are sourced from and how many emissions were associated with that. And that, yeah, that's kind of been something that's been discussed there as well. It's definitely been interesting. But what I've really been focused on is kind of some of the infrastructure for the space. So kind of the exchanges that might be going up and ABEX technologies is an example of that, which I am an investor in just FYI. But also the carbon credit royalty companies as well has been a big focus of mine. You know, particularly I just made a video about carbon streaming and kind of some of the different aspects of that company. And I'm an investor in base carbon, not to quite a large extent. It's pretty small in my portfolio because I'm expecting a lot more downside, quite frankly. But yeah, that that's some of the stuff that I've been focusing on in particular is the royalty space for sure. Some of the new entrants there. I wonder if you could provide just a couple highlights on Carbon Streamer because I'm an investor as well. I bought them basically right after the IPO and it was my mistake, of course, to hold through the pump and the dump, but I now still have my shares and I've kind of just tucked them away as a long-term hold and I haven't quite stayed up to date in their current operations, although I understand they are a carbon streaming royalty company. What kind of things did you notice in your due diligence process with them? Yeah, that was one of the things that I was focused on. Yeah, I could kind of identify, generally speaking, what happened to the company. It definitely, it got over its skis in the public markets for sure. You know, this downturn and the subsequent war and energy crisis definitely was not helpful. And, you know, some of the sell-off that we've been seeing in the carbon markets. But, you know, there's been several problems with the company. I mean, one of the main ones that's generally considered an overhang on the company is the warrant situation that they have. And that's kind of something that happened with Marin Katusa being one of the largest investors in the company. He's pretty well known for something he coined as the Katusa free ride, which is essentially where you know he buys into these private placements, he gets five-year warrants. They're very similar to options with a, you know an expiration price where you can buy into a particular company at. So it's kind of like you are injecting capital into the company by doing that, but you're also increasing the amount of shares outstanding, right? So that that can be an overhang on the company. And half of you know the total fully diluted share count is in warrants. It's around 40%, so not quite half, but it was around 40% last time I checked. So yeah, that's definitely one of the potential problems with it because with the Katusa free ride, this is not to go against Marin in any way, but you generally know if you've been in following the mining space that you know some of the companies that he gets involved with, some of the general retail investors that aren't a part of his newsletter kind of get stuck holding the bag at times. So that's kind of something to look out for. I'm assuming, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming that a lot of those shares got sold off from the private placements and they're holding on to the warrants, which is what the Katusa free ride is. So you get exposed to the upside and the warrants last for five years. So they have a long time horizon there. So you get to hold on to that as long as you want, essentially, and then you can sell off the shares. So I'm assuming that has something to do with the sell-off, but they've also had other problems as well, which is kind of something I also touch on is that you know governments can be pretty unreliable. So generally speaking, you also have to be kind of careful with the compliance markets as well. But especially as a mining investor, I do not trust uh, governments very much. So something that happened with Carbon Streaming was that their largest project, Rimba Raya, is in Indonesia. You know, it's a uh, forest project, essentially, or peat swamp, I should say. And it was going to generate 7 million credits where they had it temporarily halted from releasing new credits, essentially because the Indonesian government was trying to form new rules on the carbon markets there. So that's been another issue because by far their largest project is put on halt, essentially. And governments can take a long time to form new policy. So as far as I know, they haven't formed new policy and it's still halted, but that could have changed by now. I'm not necessarily sure. So that's been some of the issues there. But on the positive side, the company is very cheap, relatively speaking, because they're essentially trading for cash. So you're getting all the assets they have for free, which is uh, which is pretty absurd. But that's some of the deals that you can definitely find in the markets if you're if you're looking out for them. So it's 
it's trading very cheap. It's trading very cheap on a price to nav basis as well. So definitely cheap, but there are some risks as well. Yeah, it's interesting what happened in Indonesia because I had Peter Sainsbury on. I don't know if you follow him. If you don't, he's a great follow with his carbon risk substack. And we were discussing different risks involved with carbon credit creation and you know why some people say certain credits are better than others. And one of the risks that can come from government is they learn that their assets are actually very valuable. So, you know, once Brazil catches on how valuable the Amazon rainforest can be to them in the next 30 years based on carbon offset creation. They may want to kick any of those private businesses out and they'll find a way to do it with legislation. So I think you're right to be skeptical of government, especially in the space. Yeah, it's a large jurisdictional risk. That's what a lot of these companies are facing. The only company that is not like that and mostly has projects in North America is a company called Green Star Royalties, which is a subsidiary of Star Royalties. And Star Royalties is a public company, but they haven't spun out the Green Star Royalties side of the business yet, which they're planning on doing later. But for the rest of these companies, yeah, it's a, it's a huge risk because a lot of these projects are in very risky jurisdictions and quite frankly, third world countries where you don't necessarily know what the government's going to do. And there's a decent amount of political instability. And a lot of these markets are just being formed you know, relatively recently. So that's a large risk, you know, especially in Africa or Southeast Asia, some of these places, you know, you could easily have your project taken away from you essentially. So that's a large risk there. Yeah. I don't know if it gets any riskier than losing an entire project to the government. It's interesting you mentioned Star Royalties and Marin Tusa because for one, Marin was on the TIP podcast, We Study Billionaires. And that was the first introduction that I had to carbon credits. I think that was last June. And basically, I just dove right into it after that. But he was talking about companies going to the voluntary market. He didn't say it, but I'm assuming it was Carbon Streamer before they went public. And the reason I bring it up is because Marin was a mining guy first. He's a commodities mining guy, as you say. And I'd love to have his subscription, but I don't have three grand kicking around for that. (laughs) Yeah, a little uh, little rich for uh, some of the retail guys. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Even if it was like a hundred bucks, but Anyways, so considering your background in mining, Star Royalties, I'm actually an investor in Star as well. And it's because I like both sides of the business. And I'm not sure what I'll do when they spin off Green Star, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about them and also their mining side. Yeah, so I haven't done too much research into it. I kind of just started looking into them recently. They're mainly focused on gold, and then the other side is carbon credits. I don't think they have too many large projects, really, but they do have some royalties on the gold side. And then mainly for Green Star, they have forest projects, I believe, and they have one that's renewables or battery-related, I think. And then there's a regenerative agriculture project, which is their largest project. And all these are based in North America, which is kind of why I started getting interested in them. Personally, for me, I'm not really interested in gold, so I don't really want to own the main business that that they have, but I'd be more interested in Green Star, especially because they don't have that typical jurisdictional risk that a lot of the other companies have. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. And there's some good Substack articles out there and I've been following them and the CEO is, maybe I'll link in the show notes a couple of his interviews because he really goes over their whole entire operation pretty well. And of course, it's hard to tell with CEOs because at the end of the day, some of them are salesmen, but it does appear like they have a good path ahead of them in the carbon space, almost more so than their mining operations, to be honest, but it's kind of nice to get both. So just moving on to a little bit of macro talk, because that's the fun stuff. As far as voluntary credits, one of the major catalysts that I think we'll see is if the SEC decide to mandate carbon emission disclosures on, say, quarterly or annual reports. I think if that happens and companies need to start reporting their emissions, they're going to be a lot more likely to buy offsets. And those will most likely come from the voluntary space. And of course, carbon credit quality is going to start to come into question and all this double accounting and those things. But at the end of the day, basically what that means is a higher demand means a higher price. So that's just one of the things that I can see as a major tailwind for the industry. What are your thoughts on that? And what other catalysts do you see in the future? 
future. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd been looking into the SEC situation as well. I think that's definitely one of the major catalysts. And, and in general, the development of more financial incentives to get interested in ESG. With different financial funds, you know, generally investing in ESG concepts, and even still with all the energy issues going on, you know, more attacks being thrown ESG's way. We saw funds coming out of ESG recently, but actually overall, you know, over the past couple of months, I think that it's actually been positive inflows into ESG funds, which has been very interesting. Even still to this point, we're still having, you know, a decent amount of money coming into the space, which is not necessarily hitting, you know, a lot of the companies that we've covered so far, just because they're, they're small micro caps. So that's not really going to hit them yet. But something that Marin Katusa actually talked about before he was the one that actually brought this idea to my attention was the green bond market and some of the funding out of that space. So essentially the potential for you to focus more on ESG mandates and you could possibly get, you know, lower financing requirements. So you could pay a lower interest rate if, for example, you, you know, reduce emissions by 30% and you hire more women or different underrepresented groups, you know, things of that nature, kind of more of the development of the financial markets. But for the SEC to disclosures, actually, there's been some pushback on that and there's potential for, because of the uh, Supreme Court ruling against the EPA, saying that they really can't regulate carbon markets at the moment without formally being given the right to do so by Congress. The SEC climate disclosures idea is actually being challenged as well. So we're going to have to kind of see what happens there. But I mean, generally speaking, the largest catalyst I see for the space is really just the energy crisis subsiding. I mean, that's really the largest thing. So you can end up having more funds focused on ESG and there's no temptation to transition to oil and gas, which is very profitable right now. And those companies are making a lot of money. So kind of the best thing to do in the short term is actually incentivize more oil and gas production. As counterintuitive as that sounds, it's going to let us keep the price lower and you know, address demand. So we won't have to be focused on oil and gas too much. And we can kind of focus more on developing renewables and, and some of the these other you know, ESG concepts and see the carbon markets expand. And I really think that's the main catalyst, honestly. And that's kind of what I'm waiting for is to see some more supply start to come online, see kind of the oil and gas space turning around a bit. It's kind of what I'm looking at. Yeah, it's pretty hard to focus on offsetting carbon when the main goal is keeping the lights on and keeping the trucks moving. And I can see why companies would be tempted to jump into oil and gas. However, it does seem like oil and gas have been through this before, and it's kind of like a fool me once, fool me twice kind of thing. Biden, at least in the States, from what I understand, I'm in Canada, so I just see the headlines, but he's pushing pretty hard for oil and gas companies to drill. And he's proposing taxes on unused wells, and he's doing all kinds of things to try to get them to put their capital to work. But because they've seen this story before, what they're actually doing is buying back shares and paying off debt. And that is to set them up for success in the next decade. And as a result, we're not getting the supply that we would have got before. So I know specifically in Canada, if you look at some of the companies up here, that's exactly what they're doing is they're paying off debt and they're preparing themselves for the headwinds of high taxes in the future. And it, it's exactly what you say. If these companies aren't incentivized to drill and make more money, they're not going to. And what they're actually doing is playing defense and it's just resulting in less supply. But just you know, moving on from that, do you think that it's possible these funds that because this has happened before with coal, for example, coal was bastardized down to almost zero. And then all of a sudden people started buying into coal mining and, you know, the smart money. Do you think that ESG has just been hit hard enough, like you say, with carbon streamers basically at cash? They're just buying the dip right now. Who's necessarily buying the dip? Would you say? Well, I mean, it could be anybody. Could be hedge funds. Could be the smart money, as they say. If the funds are still flowing into ESG, somebody must be preparing for a better future, right? To a certain extent, and I would say it's also quite skewed right now. What counts as ESG and how much impact that's really having? Because a lot of the ESG funds that are geared towards, you know, the S and P five hundred and things like that, they're generally investing in any company that just has mandates or. Or, you know, like some of these tech companies, like they're not necessarily doing anything to lower emissions to a large extent. I mean, if you're investing in some of these funds, you're mostly just buying tech and that's not mm -hmm. necessarily all that helpful. So that is a little skewed as well. But yeah, it is a large problem that at some point, the profits are going to be so great for the oil and gas companies that they're not going to you know, be preparing for these higher taxes or buying back shares and doing these things. It's going to become such a frenzy that they're all going to start investing in supply at once. 
Uh, and that's really what you need. And one of the major problems has been the mixed messaging from Biden on that. Because at one point he's saying, okay, we need to start getting oil. And he's going and asking, or he said he was asking Saudi Arabia for to uh, drill more oil. Apparently they didn't even discuss that. But it's, it's very mixed messaging on their part. Because they're also saying that we're going to tax you on your excess profits with a windfall tax because you're making too much money. And then at the same time, they're saying you need to drill more. So it's very mixed messaging. And it's really not helpful when these companies are trying to allocate capital and figure out what investments they're going to make. So it only makes the supply gap worse. Yeah. And a a lot of people before Biden went to Saudi Arabia basically said good luck because from what at least, you know, various outlets that I've seen, the argument could be made that OPEC plus is basically at full capacity right right now. So, you know, Biden can ask them to pump more oil into the market all he wants, but they don't necessarily have the capabilities. Yes, that's that's a large issue right now. Yeah, for sure. There's all sorts of supply problems at the moment that aren't quickly addressed, and it's not going to get easier with this various mixed messaging from different government officials. Yeah. So just with that being said, moving on, is there anything else you know that you've been looking at with carbon? I feel like we've sort of touched on most of the major areas that I'm looking at. So I wonder where your head's at at the moment. Mostly I'm just, I'm tracking week by week, you know, different opportunities that are going on or not necessarily opportunities, but events that are happening in the market and seeing what kind of supplies coming online. Some of these different aspects, like an article that I was posting about Gabon, I think is the name of the country. It's a small country in Africa. I was talking about how they were going to be selling 90 million offsets into the market was something that they were discussing. So it's not a liquid market by any means. It's not centralized whatsoever. It's traded over the counter. So there's not great price discovery. So how that would play out necessarily, I don't know. But specifically for the Red Plus credits that they were planning on selling, I would imagine the price would tank if they're working on doing that. So those are actually the credits that Carbon Streaming has been getting from Rimba Raya, their largest project, is the Red Plus credits for forestry projects. So that's definitely something to look out for. But it's kind of some of those larger macro events that you're kind of looking out for in the space a bit. Yeah, and it really is so new. It's going to take some time for this market to mature, especially in the voluntary side. And especially because even on the compliance mandatory side, governments have different rules. So, you know, it's hard to keep track. Some allow offsets, some don't. Some allow certain offsets, some, you know, have different industries involved and some are aligned with Paris Agreement and others are, you know, based on government mandates or whatever. So, you know, it's hard to keep track of all this stuff, but it's definitely good to talk to people like you that are also in the space. So, I think I can just thank you for coming on and, you know, I'll have to get you back on because this is so new and everything's evolving quickly. So yeah, I just think we can end it there, but I really appreciate you spending your time here. Oh yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me on. And yeah, definitely look forward to coming back again. We have another chat for sure. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Joe is not a financial advisor and may have interest in the stocks discussed on the show. So do not take any information included within this podcast as a recommendation or formal advice. Thank you. 